So I'm delighted to be chatting to you today about the library's polar collections. A version of this talk was first given as part of the year of conversation at an event, Scotland and the Arctic, hosted by Dr. Lausanne Henderson at the University of Glasgow School of Interdisciplinary Studies at the Crichton Dumfries. The year of conversation was organised by poet, writer and force of nature, Tom Pow. And the conversation drew together a range of people, including academics, curators, First Nation storytellers, Scottish government policymakers and musicians. It was a great day. Tom asked me to speak first, giving an introduction or overview of Scotland's relationship with the Arctic regions and indeed of the Arctic with Scotland, as seen through the lens of the library's collections. And it's that talk that I'm recycling for you today. So why were we talking about the Arctic? We see articles in the news all the time, usually doom laden stories about melting ice and dying polar bears. So we think we know about the Arctic, but why should we care and be interested in a lump of ice 2000 miles away? Why does the National Library of Scotland collect books and resources about the Arctic? Hopefully, over the next 25 minutes, I'll be able to address some of those questions. For those of you unfamiliar with the Library, National Library of Scotland, we are the, na the largest na library in Scotland, holding more than 28 million items in stewardship for the people of Scotland. Your collection spans 10 centuries and a rich variety of formats. We have books. Old books, rare books, paperbacks, hardbacks, books in rare bindings, artist books and ebooks. We have maps, films, music, manuscript and archives. We have journals, serials and newspapers in both paper and e-formats. We have posters, photographs and sounds. We have web pages, data sets and digital mapping. My role within the library is to curate our map, mountain and polar collections which means that I collect and develop them and tell people about them through our web resources, exhibitions, talks like this and through our catalogue. So it won't surprise you to know that when Tom invited me to speak, my first thought was to search in our catalogues to see what we have in the library's collections about the Arctic. A quick library search reveals 11,619 hits for the Arctic. And if I extend that search to include outside e-resources, it jumps to more than 123,000. With so much to choose from, you'd be glad to know that I've selected only a few voices from the collection or we wouldn't finish in time for tea. The core of the library's polar collections are the 4,000 books previously belonging to Sir James Mann Wordy. He also gave us his personal archive. Wordy was born and educated in Glasgow and he's best known as the geologist on Shackleton's ill-fated endurance expedition. But he went on to become the master of St John's College, Cambridge, president of the Royal Geographical Society and chairman of the British Mountaineering Council. He travelled to Spitsbergen with William Spears Bruce and led several university expeditions to Greenland with his method of sailing in quickly, doing science for a couple of short summer months, making use of the continual daylight and then being back in time for the start of the Michaelmas term. It's a model followed by student expeditions to this day. He was always careful to take extra provisions in case of becoming iced in. News, this newspaper report outlines a typical research trip. From the Aberdeen Journal, Wednesday the 16th of February 1927. Aberdeen to East Greenland. Cambridge Expedition, Story of Coastal Exploration. To the Aberdeen Centre of the RSGS in the YMCA Hall last night, Mr Wordy said the Cambridge expedition to East Greenland of 1926 consisted of a party of eight Cambridge men in the chartered Norwegian ship Heimland of 65 tonnes net. The ship sailed from Aberdeen at the end of June, making Jan Mayen Island five days later. The unusually short space of three days was sufficient to navigate the ice pack brought down by the polar current. And on this occasion, favourable winds and abnormally good weather made the passage of the ice a comparatively simple matter. The East Greenland coast was reached on July the 11th in the neighbourhood of Pendulum and Sabine Islands. 
The area was carefully mapped and many fresh discoveries were made, including a new large inlet. Numerous remains pointing to a former inhabitation by Eskimo were found, such as tent rings, fox traps, graves and winter houses of stones. Many of the latter were excavated and implements found, mainly spearheads of bone, stone arrowheads and harpoons. Children's toys and human figures carved in wood were also collected. The finds indicated a people that had never had any contact with Europeans and must have died out not more than a hundred years ago. This disappearance of a people so peculiarly suited to the polar environment was probably due to the migration or failure of food supply brought about possibly by climate change. In all, the expedition explored over 200 miles of new coast, discovering many new fjords and islands. The course was set homewards in the last week of August and Aberdeen was reached on September the 8th. It's interesting for us to note that climate change was considered a factor in the abandonment of the Inuit settlements they found sometime in the first half of the 19th century. To me, sorry, that should be the 20th century. No, they must have been abandoned in the 19th century, but it was written up in the early 20th, there we go. To me, this highlights the value of exploring our collections in gathering evidence of changes in the region. For the library, the gift of Wordy's archive and books means that we can make available an unusually comprehensive historic polar collection to both the general Scottish public and polar researchers from across the globe. And since that acquisition in the 1950s, we have expanded and grown the polar collection through curated purchases made possible through the Graham Brown Trust, in addition to the items brought in through the legal deposit privilege. We're therefore uniquely placed to provide information on both poles, in whichever future is brought about by those changing climatic conditions signalled by Wordy himself. And while researchers cannot take the books away from in the library as they could from his St John's study, I like to think that Wordy would be happy that anyone could come and use his books. The North and the North Pole has long held fascination for people. This representation is based on Mercator's map from the 1560s. It's not depicted as a real place, but as a mythic landscape, perhaps even as an Eden paradise, with four rivers watering the world, a motif which also appears in Hindu culture. Maps at this time were a merging of calculated geographic positions in latitude and longitude, written descriptions and inevitably Bible stories. I would like to believe that the scale bar here is the root of the depiction of the North Pole as a barber's pole. You can make out the red and white stripes. I love how this map is, is an amalgam of art and science. Today, our knowledge of the area is much more complex and nuanced. In modern maps, there is no room for myth or legend. And yet, what is a scientific hypothesis, if not the best fitting story? The lack of early European knowledge of the area is conveyed well in this map of the Arctic regions produced by Jan Blau in his World Atlas of 1662. The coastlines known to the Dutch sailors from whom Blau gathered his information are included and then there's a blank. There's something about a blank on a map that draws people in, instilling fascination and variously a desire to colour it in, to write upon it, to stake a claim to it. Arthur Conan Doyle in The Glamour of the Arctic and the Idler, July 1892, which was written after his voyage as ship's surgeon aboard the Arctic whaler, the SS Hope, a couple of years earlier. It is a region of romance also. You stand on the very brink of the unknown and every duck you shoot bears pebbles in its gizzard, which come from a land which the maps know not. This blank area, so often filled in on maps with white for sea ice, means that it's very easy for us to forget how diverse the area is. As a geographical region, the Arctic is vast, covering an excess of five and a half million square miles. Its common feature is its high latitude, but there exists a great variety of conditions, terrain, geology, weather, climate, ice, snow, peoples, flora and fauna over that whole area. And I think we need to guard against a homogenization of the Arctic and be respectful of that variety. The fascination of the unknown is of course shared by many of us 
And I think Scots travellers and their responses provide context for some of the wider ongoing discussions in the region. An incomplete list of Scottish explorers and travellers, John Ross, who searched for the Northwest Passage, the desire for shipping and routes and exploitation is nothing new. Thomas Abernethy was in the first party ever to reach the North Magnetic Pole, which of course shifts, making this an ever-changing target for adventurers. Thomas Simpson, member of the Hudson Bay Company and survey surveyor of the north coast of Canada. John Ray, best known for reporting the fate of the Franklin expedition, but also exploring large areas of Arctic Canada including a land expedition with fellow Scot John Richardson, scattering their names among the rivers, inlets and mountains of the region. William Spears Bruce, with whaling and exploration trips, leading to the creation of the Scottish Spitsbergen Syndicate looking for minerals in those islands. Alistair Mackay, who's on the Car Luke, exploring, exploring west of the Parry Archipelago. Isabel Wiley Hutchison, Arctic traveller and botanist, visited Greenland and Alaska. Our friend James Mann Wordy, geologist with the Spitsbergen Syndicate and various Cambridge University expeditions specifically to East Greenland. Myrtle Simpson, the first woman to ski across Greenland on an unsupported expedition. Sue Stockdale, the first British woman to ski to the Magnetic North Pole in 1996. Craig Matheson, previously at unclimbed peaks in Greenland and the geographical North Pole, founder of the West Lothian based Polar Academy. Nancy Campbell, writer in residence at the world's most northerly museum at Apernovik. And the list could go on and on. So we'll have a snippet from Nancy from the Library of Ice, chosen because of its tale of losses in translation and a desire to understand. I'd collected more books on my travels, of course, and among them was a copy of the Greenlandic English Dictionary, the same old edition I'd consulted in Apernovik Museum. Before I shelved it, I was unable to resist opening it once more. I was careful of its flaking spine, its delicate paper wrappers, which had received too much wear in the last few years. I recalled my conversations with Greta about its contents and wondered again at both her keenness to teach me her language and her weariness of writing it down. I came to the page on which Illis Verupa was defined. To put something in a safe place, but to be unable to find it again. Perhaps because I was looking at the dictionary in a comfortable armchair rather than at a desk in a polar museum, something in the tone of the English definition now struck me as discordant. I knew the dictionary was unreliable. A previous owner had made several connections in the margins in a shaky hand. I viewed the book despite and even because of its possible inaccuracies. I decided to check the meaning of Illis Virupa in the online dictionary, recently launched by Greenland's Language Secretariat. And then I realised the danger of learning from a book. Itself in translation and nearly a century old, for the modern definition was different, or so I thought at first, to bury in a grave or coffin. Either the original author was wrong, or the meaning had shifted, or could both senses be correct? Is the grave a safe place to leave words? And is something placed in a coffin really lost? What if the burial place were not a grave, but an icy pile of stones, a cairn, an ice house, a place in which a message might rest until the right person came to find it? I thought of the objects buried under the ice around Upernavik, awaiting discovery as global temperatures warmed. It would not be long now until those stories were revealed. The disappearing ice was contained in our story now. And of course, there are many Scots visitors to the Arctic whose names have never been recorded and whose voices are hushed in the historical record. Men who sailed in the hunt for whales or merchants on merchant and military vessels on the Arctic convoys. The first privilege for whaling was granted by King James the Sixth and First in 1613. It was a relatively local affair until all the first Scottish ships sailed for Greenland and the Davis Strait in 1749. All the major East Coast ports of the time, Banff, Fraserburgh, Peterhead, Aberdeen, Dundee, Kirkcaldy and Bowness, were involved in the trade for seals and whales, as well as building the boats required. Whaling was a hugely important industry to Scotland, 
At its height in 1857, more than 400 vessels and 13,000 men were involved. It is estimated that a total of 20,000 Greenland right whales and bowhead were killed, and hundreds of thousands of seals, which is perhaps why we don't like talking about it now. And the desire to exploit the potential rich resources of parts of the region have led to investigative assay expeditions like William Spears Bruce's Scottish Spitsbergen Syndicate founded in 1909. They went seven times to Svalbard up to 1922, hoping to find coal, gypsum, iron ore, marble and possibly petroleum. By 1920, the syndicate had filed claims for mining rights to seven, more than 7,500 square kilometres, much more than any other company. And to protect these claims, Bruce petitioned the British government to reassert British rights to the sovereign control over the archipelago. But there was little real interest in Whitehall for such an annexation. Svalbard's position in international law was not resolved until the Spitsbergen Treaty was signed in Paris in 1920, and Norway became the sovereign power in 1925. Wordy was subsequently awarded a medal by the Norwegian government for his geological survey of the island carried out while with the syndicate. But we don't have to travel so far to experience the Arctic, or at least the sub-Arctic environment. The Scottish mountains have been used as training grounds, not only for generations of climbers and explorers heading off to the more extreme environments, but also for military exercises. Scotland's high mountains, famously the Cairngorms Plateau, but also more isolated peaks across the northwest, are home to Arctic alpine plant communities with lichen-rich heaths, snowbed communities and montane bogs. The Arctic alpine flora is outstanding, with alpine sow thistle, trailing azalea and alpine milk vetch, amongst many others. The Cairngorms National Park alone has 758 native and archaeophyte taxa in its rare plant list, which includes many sedges, reeds and grasses, only available here and at height. We can't talk about the Cairngorms without drawing on Nan Shepherd, the Living Mountain. The more one learns of this intricate interplay of soil, attitude, weather, and the living tissues of plant and insect, an intricacy that has its astonishing moments as when sundew and butterwort eat their insects, the more the mystery deepens. Knowledge does not dispel mystery. Scientists tell me that the alpine flora of the Scottish mountains is arctic in origin, that these small scattered plants have outlived the glacial period and are the only vegetable life in our country that is older than the Ice Age. But that doesn't explain them, it only adds time to the equation and gives it a new dimension. I find have a, I have a naive faith in my scientist friends, they are such jolly people. They wouldn't fib to me unnecessarily, and their stories make the world so interesting. But my imagination boggles at this. I can imagine the antiquity of rock, but the antiquity of a living flower? That is harder. It means that these tufts of the mountain top, with their angelic inflorescence and the devil in their roots, have had the cunning and the effrontery to cheat not only a winter, but an ice age. The scientists have the humility to acknowledge that they don't know how it's been done. I'm sure you'll agree that these tiny plants are miraculous. Has anyone who's seen the skeins of geese flying overhead in winter or heard that wonderf wonderful distant honking as they fly almost too high to see, will know many of the birds fly south to overwinter and to avoid the extreme cold of their Arctic breeding grounds. Our Arctic conversation in Dumfries was accompanied by a series of events, including dusk goose watching over the town. Tom made lapel badges with the lovely phrase, keep on looking up. But despite that, not a single goose was seen. Hopefully they'll have more luck at this year's Wild Goose Festival, where the, the plan is to continue some of our Arctic conversations. Birds come from Scotland come to Scotland for the winter from Greenland, from Svalbard, from the northern shores of Russia and Finland and Norway, sheltering on our shores. Other species bear their origins in their name, the Arctic skua of Shetland and Orkney. Arctic terns breed here in the subarctic before flying to Antarctica, spending their life in perpetual summer. 
and it's not only birds. The Arctic char are found in 258 Scottish lochs. It's likely that the Arctic char was the first freshwater fish to colonise Scotland after the last ice age. And again, I could go on, but we don't have time. So learning from the library's collections, I have come to the conclusion that we all need to be having a conversation about and with the Arctic. I'm aware that my conversation has been one sided, mostly about Scots visiting the Arctic and about Scotland being sub-Arctic, rather than about how our marginal nation on the fringes of Arctic Scotland is seen from inside the circle. But we have to begin somewhere. And it's important that we understand and engage with the Arctic in its widest sense for several reasons. Scotland's geographical location. Outside of the seven Arctic Council's countries, Scotland is the next most northerly. Scotland is partially sub-Arctic, so anything that affects the Arctic must affect us. We share histories. Using the literary, scientific and creative responses of Scots who have travelled there will help us all to understand the changes to the whole region and indeed formulate our own responses. We have a common desire to preserve wilderness areas and protect our unique and special species, cultures and places. And we share a desire to minimise our impact on the environment and want to share expertise in areas such as energy efficiency and transport. But mostly, we should understand and engage with the Arctic because we can learn so much from each other. <laughs>